actually mentions a number of passages which we'll not be able to deal with all of them tonight, but we will note a number of them. And we'll also uh, look at some passages even in the New Testament as we consider how these things apply to us. From these verses, I see, first of all, that we need to work honestly. As we go about our life, and there are many areas in which we work, whether it is working within the home, or whether it is working outside of the home to provide for in the home, or whether it is even working for the Lord, or whether it's working in a volunteer sense, we work in, in many different areas and in, in many different avenues, but in every area, I believe that these, these principles ring true that we need to work honestly. We need to work honestly. Solomon said in verse 3, treasure, excuse me, verse 2, treasures of wickedness profit nothing. Many people in this world work day in and day out in a very wicked manner. And they get their uh, income, if you want to call it their, or, or their gains by wickedness and by evilness and by dishonesty. May it never be said of God's people that we are dishonest in our work. But why are treasures of the wicked, why do they profit nothing? Well, he goes on and tells us in the second part of verse 3. Because God casts away the substance of the wicked. Eventually... We're told here, the principle is told that God will eventually take the substance away from the wicked. Now that may be at death. That may be when the world comes to an end that that's talking about. It may not happen necessarily in this life, but we can see that there is the principle there. In Proverbs 13 and verse 11, in the first part of that proverb, Solomon says, Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished. The same idea that, that the person who makes it his endeavor to gain his wealth by vanity, by fraud, by uh, wickedness, by evil, then that is going to diminish, that is going to be taken from him eventually. Amen. Proverbs 28 and verse 22. The Proverbs writer says, He that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye, and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. I said that those things may not be taken away from them in this physical life as long as they live on earth. They may go to the grave having numerous assets, if you will, having a great number, uh, amount of money to their name even, or a great amount of wealth to their name. But if in this life they have obtained that wealth by vanity, by fraud, by wickedness, by evil, it will be taken from them, essentially. All of what they considered wealth will be taken from them. I'm reminded very vividly of the occasion that Jesus tells about with rich, the rich man and Lazarus. You remember Lazarus that he names there was a, was a beggar. And this rich man would not even so much as give this beggar Lazarus the crumbs from his table. This rich man was obviously rich because, uh, partially because of his greediness. And so he was not... Uh, the most honest, the most humble, the most giving person that there was. But as soon as they died, we see the tables turn. And how that beggar, Lazarus, became a very rich man in, in, the, in the bosom of Abraham, in the place that we call paradise. And they were separated by a great gulf. And on the other side of the gulf is what we call torments or Hades. or It would have been that, the, the, the side of suffering. Uh, in the Hadean realm and there is where the rich man was and so he immediately became poor if you will in his in spiritual things the Bible tells us in 2nd Peter chapter 3 and verse 10 that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night we do not know when Jesus is coming back a number of individuals have tried and probably are still trying today to predict when Jesus is coming back we can rest assured that he's coming back. Verse 9 tells us that in 2 Peter chapter 3. That he's not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackening, slackness, but he's long-suffering toward us. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. A thief typically does not announce when he's coming. 
He doesn't let you know, hey, I'm going to be there at this time. And that is the same way that Jesus is going to return. The Bible tells us that he's coming as a thief in the night. And when he does, the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. And the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So every physical thing as we know it will be dissolved, will be non-existent. God made it, and he's the one that can take it out of existence, and he is the one that will take it out of existence. Side note, there are many today who are pressing and teaching uh, that the environment is within our hands. It's within our power. And if you were to get down to the, the root of all of this, really it's a money-making scheme, but there are many who are pushing for this idea of global warming or climate change, and, and in response to that, you need to purchase products that uh, they've got their hands dipped in, basically, to prevent the pollution that we're causing. God has said in, all the way back in Genesis chapter 8 that as long as the earth continues, that he is going to continue to provide what it needs that it's not until he destroys it that it will be destroyed now with that i believe that we should be good stewards of what god has given us i don't mean that we should just uh, completely trash the earth that he has given us and treat it with disdain but also we shouldn't give in to the the tactics that many have and that are trying to deceive us about our being in control of this physical earth God upholds the world by the word of his power, Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3. All right, I got sidetracked a little bit there. But every physical thing will be burned up, so the treasures of wickedness profit nothing. Therefore, we need to work honestly. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 16 in verse 26 we can work this life the entirety of our lives gaining things in the world but in the end those things are going to be burned up it's all going to burn up and so we need to be working honestly furthermore in this uh, passage here in, in, in Proverbs 10 verses 2 and 3 he says righteousness delivereth from death in verse 3 in the first part of that verse he, it says the Lord will not suffer will not allow the soul of the righteous to famish sometimes <clears throat> when things do not come out the way that people think that they should they begin to blame God sometimes when their bank account is not as large as they think it should be they may blame God and many that is their endeavor in life that they are uh, working toward the purpose of, of God giving them physical riches and that if they in their minds are, are faithful to him that he will bless them physically nowhere are we promised that we will be have an abundance in this life. Nowhere are we promised that we are going to be rich in this world. But we are promised that if we will seek first the kingdom, that's the church, if we will seek first the kingdom of God and, and His righteousness, we seek to do what is right in the way that He has mandated what is right and what is wrong, then He will provide all that we need. In Matthew 6 and verse 33, uh, we read those words, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Well, what are the things? If you go to that context and you look at Matthew chapter 6, he's talking about necessities. He's not talking about the riches of this world, but he's talking about necessities. He, he says, Jesus says, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about what you're going to eat and what you're going to put on. Every day has its troubles, and I'm paraphrasing, obviously. I'm not uh, quoting this directly, but Jesus says if, if we will seek first, if our first priority is the church and doing right according to what God has said is right, then we are going to have what we need. 
we're going to have what we need. Righteousness delivereth from death. That's the idea. In, in Proverbs 13 and verse 11, the second part of that verse, the proverb says, He that gathereth by labor shall increase. But we are tempted to think the opposite. I said sometimes life just doesn't seem fair, even in the, the, the work field. And sometimes it seems that those that are evil are the ones who are prospering. And it seems that those who are trying to do what is right and trying to do what is good, and they are trying to seek first the kingdom of God, are those that are not prospering the way that the evil are. Um, that is nothing new. Jeremiah was concerned about that same thing. He asked God in his day, according to Jeremiah 12 and verse 1, he first said to God, Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I pled with thee, yet let me talk with thee, or plead with thee, let, yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. He says, Why doth the way of the wicked prosper? Why are all the happy that deal with, uh, deal very, are all they happy that deal very treacherously? And so he asked the same question that many of us may ask. Why are those who are doing wrong prospering? Why are those who are doing evil seeming to, to have more wealth than those who are trying to do well and trying to do good and trying to do honestly? Well, that may discourage us. It may discourage us to maybe want to begin working dishonestly. It may discourage us because uh, we want to know when we're going to get ours. We want to know when we're going to get our uh, reward. And so we may be tempted to do things like cheat on our taxes because there's increase there. There's gain to, 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 to be had if we will just cheat on our taxes. We can gain wealth that way. Or to be dishonest about our work hours. You know, there's wealth to be had in that. Or to be dishonest about our travel expenses. There's wealth to be had in that. Or to slack off when the boss is not around. Or to pretend to be in need when we really could be working to provide for our needs. We may be tempted to be dishonest in our work in so many ways, but do not let the, the ways of the evil, do not let the wealth of the evil, do not let their physical riches discourage us into wanting to work dishonestly. May we work honestly as the Proverbs writer encourage us, encourages us to do. Essentially, all of those things I mentioned can be reduced down to thievery, stealing. Interestingly, the other day, I was at the gas pump, and just on the other side of my pump, there was a lady who was talking on the phone, and uh, she was telling the person on the phone about a, a young boy. I don't know the age. I don't know... Uh, her relationship with him, if he is a student or if he is someone she counsels. Uh, but she's, she was talking about this young boy and said, uh, said to the person on the phone, he told me that stealing is good. And she said, what? No, it's not. He said, yes, stealing is good because then everything is free. That's what many people are being taught in our society. That's what many people are believing in our society. But we go to the Bible and we are encouraged to, to work honestly. In Psalm 37 and verse 7, the psalmist says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Fret not thyself because of Him who prospereth in His way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 6 beginning, 1 Timothy 6, verse 6, beginning, Paul writing to Timothy, said to him, Godliness with contentment is great gain. While the world says that physical riches are great gain, he says godliness with contentment is great gain. He says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich... Fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition, for the love of money 
is the root of all kinds of evil. The King James says all evil. The idea there is all kinds of evil. The American Standard, I believe, puts it that way. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10. We need to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all the things that we need will be added unto us. Now that may come by the work of our own hands because that's what God commands us to do. So if we're seeking first His church and doing what He says is right, then we're going to work with our hands to provide for our own as we read in other passages of the Bible. May we, if we're going to be wise workers, the way that Solomon wanted his son to work, then we're going to work honestly. In the second place, if we're going to uh, work in a wise way, as, as Solomon put it toward his son, we need to work earnestly. We need to work earnestly. An earnest worker is a diligent worker. An earnest worker is a diligent worker. Back in Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 4, He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, that is a, a hand that is... Uh, restrains itself from working uh, a, a lazy hand if you will but the hand of the diligent maketh rich an earnest worker is a di diligent worker in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 9 we read he also that is slothful some other translations say a sluggard the idea is someone who is lazy Someone who holds back on doing what they are able to do. The, the, he who is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster or a great destroyer. And so it is that diligence in our work is constructive. It builds. But laziness is destructive. It destroys Continuing in looking at passages from Proverbs, under this idea that an earnest worker is a diligent worker, we see in Proverbs 13 and verse 4, that the soul of the sluggard desireth, he desires to have things, but he has nothing. He says, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. That means full, complete, uh, rich have what he needs. Uh, this is one of my favorite Proverbs, and one reason is because I need to hear it often. And because I have dreams. I have desires, certain ways that I want things to be or I wish for things to be, but if I'm not willing to put in the work, then it will never be that way. Uh, think of uh, the app we have on our phones. I'm on there too, Pinterest. That's a, that's a, that's a good... Uh, uh, a good place to feed our lazy desire, if you will. A lot of things we can dream about and desire. I wish I had that. I wish I had this. But if we're just on Pinterest all day long looking at those things, we're never going to get done what we need to get done, right? We're never going to accomplish those things that we desire. We desire to move up in our jobs. But if we're not willing to put in the work, then it's not going to happen. If we desire to, to have faithful Christian children and families, but we're not willing to put in the work and we decide to just leave that into the, the preacher's hands and the Bible class teacher's hands, then we should not expect the, the greater end. If we desire to go to heaven, but we're not willing to put in the work, if we desire to take others to heaven, but we're not willing to, to put in the work, we desire to have a full church building, but we're not willing to put in the work, that all falls under th this proverb here that the, the sluggard desireth and has nothing. But the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. An earnest worker is a diligent worker. And an earnest worker is also a punctual worker. I struggle with procrastination. I know none of you ever put anything off, do you? I struggle with procrastination but time and again the Bible teaches against us against it the Bible encourages us to be punctual in our endeavors in our work especially for the Lord and so we see in in Proverbs 10 and verse 5 that he that gathereth in the summer 
is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causeth shame. The Proverbs writer says in Proverbs 6, if you want to go over there and notice a few verses there. Proverbs 6, beginning with verse 6. Of all things, Solomon tells his son, look at the ant. He says, go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth for her food in the harvest. How long will thou sleep, O sluggard? When will thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a, sleep, a, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, and thy want, thy lack, as an armed man. And so it is the principle that he, he encourages his son to look at the ant and how diligent the ant is and how punctual the ant is to make sure that it is provided for. And it doesn't have someone on its back constantly uh, keeping it in line and telling, motiv motivating it to keep going, but it is uh, self-motivated, if you will. It has instinct. It is a punctual Worker. So we look at the ant and we apply that same principle to ourselves that we be punctual and diligent in our work. If we want to be wise workers, we need to work honestly. We need to work earnestly. Furthermore, I see this principle in the book of Proverbs that we need to work modestly. We've considered some of this already in some passages. By modest, I mean another word for modesty is humility or shamefacedness or uh, being humble in general uh, the person who is modest in his work is a person who is humble uh, in, in Proverbs 23 and verse 4 the Proverbs writer says labor not to be rich cease from thine own wisdom in other words that's while you labor you may become rich in, in this world, in the eyes of this world, you may have a great amount of wealth, and especially when you compare yourselves to those perhaps in, in other nations, although while we also have a higher uh, cost of living than other nations in many ways also, but when you compare yourself, we can gain a, a great amount of wealth in our work, but that should not be our endeavor in this life, that that all I want to do in this life is to become rich. He says, labor not to be rich. Cease from your own wisdom. And we can look at Proverbs 3, and verse 5 and 6, where the Proverbs writer says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. So this person who is a modest worker is not only humble, but he's also thankful. He realizes who has given him the ability to work. He realizes who directs him in uh, the paths of wisdom. And so he acknowledges the Lord. He trusts in him with all his heart and leans to him for his understanding. This person is thankful. The modest worker is humble is thankful and then also I see the modest worker is charitable that means he's generous he's giving he realizes that as I'm working in life I'm not just doing it to boast myself in riches but I'm doing it so that I can help others that cannot work or that I can help others who uh, are in desperately in need who truly are in need and we see this over and again in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 21 and verse 26. The proverb says, He coveteth greedily all the day long, but the righteous giveth and spareth not. He's generous. In Proverbs 11, verses 24 through 26. I'm going to read from the English Standard Version on this one. And it says the same thing in the King James, just the, the way that the words are used... Uh, there, this is a little more plain. It, one gives freely. This person who is generous, he gives freely, yet he grows all the richer. 
Another withholds what he should give and only suffers lack. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and, and, and one who waters will himself be watered. The people curse him who holds back grain, but a blessing is on the head of him who sells it. I believe we can see that principle in, in the New Testament when we are commanded to give upon the first day of the week, even as a part of our worship. As we give, that we're to give uh, not grudgingly, not out of necessity, but as a cheerful giver, as one who realizes that I will never be able to give to God what He has given to me. I will never be able to outgive God. And we also do not do it for the purpose of getting more back from God, but there is the principle that is told there that whosoever uh, soweth sparingly reapeth sparingly, whoever sows uh, uh, greatly or in abundance, then he also will reap in abundance as we think about working modestly in other words as we work it's, it's not our goal to just gain riches in this life but rather it is our goal to, to be humble it is our goal to be thankful and it is our goal to be charitable to be giving as we look at this modest worker I'm reminded of the teachings of Jesus in the book of Luke in the book of Luke we, uh, Luke records at least six occasions, I believe it's only six that I counted, where a rich man is specifically mentioned. Six occasions in Luke where a rich man is specifically mentioned. In Luke 12, 16 through 21, there's the rich farmer who stored up uh, treasures on earth instead of, he uh, instead of heaven. He, he, uh, his barns were full but he had such great gain that he wanted to tear those down and, and build larger to be able to store up. And then he could take his rest for the rest of his life, it, uh, soul, you, you know, be filled. Uh, and that night it says that his soul was required of him. We read about the rich man with an unjust steward in Luke 16, 1 through 13. And from that text, apparently that rich man was not a wise man. We read about the rich man and Lazarus in Luke uh, 16, 19 through 31, in which the rich man is being shown in a, in a negative light, but, the, but Lazarus, who is, whose name is given to us, is being shown in a very positive light, a man who was a beggar. There's the rich young ruler, as we call him, in Luke 18, verses 18 through 27. And many of you will remember that account as this rich young man came to Jesus and, and he tells Jesus that, uh, or he asks Jesus, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus tells him uh, to keep the commandments. And he says, from my youth I have kept the commandments. Jesus says, go and sell all that you have and come and follow me. He went away sorrowful. Jesus knew that what would keep him from serving him was his wealth. That, he, that that is what would be between him and God was his physical riches because he had very much, uh, very many possessions, the text tells us. And then we have the rich men who were casting their gifts into the treasury, we're told in Luke 21, verses 1 through 4. We're not told who these rich men are, and certainly they may have been given a uh, faithful amount in, in, in uh, concerning how much they had, but they were given out of their abundance. And Jesus was praising this widow who gave all that she had, which was two mites. It was a much smaller amount compared to what the rich men were giving. But in comparison, by comparison, it was much greater because she gave all that she had. The sixth place that we read about a rich man or rich men is Luke 19. 1 through 9. I want to, I want to, I invite you there for just a moment. Luke 19, verses 1 through 9. We read about this man who I relate to because he was of small stature. <laughs> you know, when uh, Brother Larry said earlier that I'm not so little anymore, I know that I'm still short, so he must be talking about this way. Zacchaeus, I, I'm just kidding. I know that uh, 
I'm going this way. Uh, Luke 19, beginning with verse 1, we read about Zacchaeus. Jesus uh, was entering and he passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans. He was a tax collector and he was rich, it tells us. He was a very wealthy man. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was. But he could not for the press because he was little of stature. And so he was committed to seeing Jesus. He ran before and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. And, and as Jesus was to pass that way on his journey. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he saw him. And he said unto Zacchaeus, Make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and he came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, they complained, saying that he, that is Jesus, was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. You see, the Jews definitely did not like a man who took their money, who worked for the Roman government. Here is a, one of their own, a Jew, Zacchaeus, who would take their money, tax them, and then the money would be given to the government. But of course he had to keep his own percentage as well. How else did he become rich? But this man, Zacchaeus was determined to be a follower of Jesus. It says that Zacchaeus stood, verse 8, and he said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. Do we give 50%? Would we, would we give 50% of what we have to the poor? He says, The half of my goods I, I will give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false occasion... A false accusation, excuse me. I will restore him fourfold. So if I have taken a hundred dollars by false accusation, I will restore him four hundred. If I have taken a thousand dollars by false accusation, I will restore him four thousand. We can see the penitence in Zacchaeus on this occasion and the devotion that he had to following Jesus. But I also want us to see. Yes, he was a rich man, but he was very generous. He may have not have been generous before he met Jesus. We don't know uh, so much about his life before meeting Jesus. But on this occasion, he was declaring and confessing that from that point forward, at least, he was going to be very charitable, very generous in his giving. He was going to give half of what he had to the poor and that he was going to restore to those that he had done wrong fourfold. And so Jesus said to him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. I said that Luke records six occasions with rich men in them. And I, I numbered each of those. The only one of those six where Jesus names the person and where Jesus praises the person who is rich is the occasion of Zacchaeus. Which goes along with what else Jesus said, that it, it's easier for the cam a, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It, it's just a, a common commonality that those who are working to be rich in this life are not looking to seek first the kingdom of God. Now there is the occasion in which we have in our midst... We have a brother or sister who is in Christ and who is faithful to Christ, faithful to his church, faithful to doing what is right, and they have very much. But they are also giving very much if they are faithful uh, to God. In 1 Timothy 6, verses 17 through 19, Paul said there to Timothy, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor tr trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, that means willing to, to give, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. In Ephesians 4 and verse 28, Paul says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. In other words, so that he will be able to give to the person that is in need. And so as we work, we need to work honestly, work earnestly, and work 
modestly with the idea that I'm humble. I realize and I am thankful that without God and without what God has given me, I would not have the ability to even work. But as I do work, I will always keep in mind to help those who are in need, as the Bible teaches us. May all of our work be done earnestly, honestly, and modestly. But I would be remiss this evening if I did not tell you that you can work all of your life. You can accomplish great things on this earth. You can even work honestly, earnestly, modestly, and it all be for nothing. You can build a large family. You can have great wealth. You can even leave behind a legacy. But the psalmist says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that do build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. On one occasion, there were some people who asked Jesus, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. You know, many say that we're not saved by works. And it is the case that we did not come up with the gospel system, we did not send a Savior. And it is not by our works that, uh, that other men can be saved or even that we can be saved. And there's no work of merit that we can do to where God says, okay, he has done good enough. I, I'm pleased with his work. I owe him salvation. No, but there are works, there are actions that God commands beginning with belief. He, they said, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? And he says the work of God is that you believe on him whom he sent. Faith is a work. And faith works. Biblical faith is not just a mental acknowledgement of who Jesus is. It is, it is a physical or an even spiritual uh, application of who he is. That we follow him. That we walk after him. That we do what he says. Without faith it is, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11 Verse 6. But faith that pleases God is faith that leads to repentance. Peter said, he, that, uh, re he says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Acts 2 and verse 38. Faith that pleases God is not only faith that leads to repentance, but it is faith that confesses in, uh, the faith in Christ. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10 and verse 10 tells us. Faith that pleases God is faith that leads to the waters of baptism. Peter's already said it in Acts 2.38, but we can also see in Mark 16 and verse 16 that it's in the waters of baptisms that, that we are saved. It is there that our sins are washed away, Acts 22.16. It is there that we bury the old men of sin, Romans 6, 3 and 4. And so it is that faith that pleases God is also faith that remains even through the point of death. Be thou faithful unto death. Literally, within the context there in Revelation 2 and verse 10, it means be so faithful to the God that you will die for the cause, that you will be put to death as a martyr, that you will be put to death because of your faith in Jesus Christ. But there's also the principle there that we are faithful even to the point of even natural death. Be thou faithful unto death, and he will give you a, I will give thee a crown of life, Jesus says. So we must hear the word of God because faith comes by hearing and hearing by God's word, Romans 10 and verse 17. We must believe, as we've already noted, if we want to work the work of God, which is going to, if we truly believe, then that's going to lead us to repentance. And if we've truly repented, that's going to lead us to the confession of our faith in Jesus 
And that's going to lead us to the waters of baptism where it is said that we are saved, where our sins are washed away, and where uh, the Lord adds us to the church where we are put into Christ. And it is then, from then that point forward, that we can walk as Christians being faithful to God all the days of our lives. And even in the kingdom, we can work honestly, earnestly, and modestly. Tonight, you may be a child of God who needs to respond to the Lord's invitation. You may have not become a child of God, and, and we have told you what you need to do. Before we have the invitation song, I want to end with an illustration. There was a father who was helping his son uh, adjust his tie just before his graduation ceremony. He was in high school, finishing up, graduating from high school, and his father said, I, Son, I, I want to ask you a question. What do you plan to do after tonight? And he says, Dad, you know, you've visited the college with me. We're, I'm going to college, you know. I'm going to major in education. Oh, well, that's great, son. I look forward to you going to college and, and putting diligence into your studies and, and getting a degree and being able uh, to use that in your life and but then what? Well, maybe I'll meet some special lady while I'm in college and, and we'll get married and we'll start a family. He says, that would be wonderful. I'd love to have a daughter-in-law and I'd love to have grandchildren. He says, but then what? He says, I'll, you know, I'll work. I'll, I'll go through my career path and... and Take care of my family and rear them up just as you've reared me. And, and he says, that's good. He says, I hope that you uh, attain to great things and do great things in your life. And you always take care of your family. He says, but then what? Well, uh, I'll, I'll probably retire one day and uh, enjoy my last days. And, and maybe go see a lot of things in, in this world. And maybe even my children, they might even have children. And That's wonderful, son. I, if I get to see my great-grandchildren, that would be even more of a blessing. He said, that would be great if you, if you are able to retire and uh, to take it easy the, the final days of your life and not have to work. But then what well I, I don't know dad I, I guess I'll die that's right son you will one day you will die but then what tonight are you prepared for life after death if not come as we stand and sing